Hello, everybody, and welcome to an episode of Trauma Plicity Talk Show with Dr. Amanda Hellman. That's me. And Trauma Plicity is trauma plus simplicity. I know trauma happens in different forms for all of us. And simplicity is helping our brain know that we can take simple steps to heal from trauma. And so this show, the purpose is to have different people on to share their journey, parts of their journey and their overcoming of trauma or their process of going through the journey of overcoming parts of trauma and the steps that they use to heal so that you as the audience can identify some things that may be helpful for you and also to relate to their stories. And so this is a really the purpose of the show is for hope and for us to move ahead. So thank you all for being here. And today I am so excited to have my friend Tamika Smith here. And Tamika is a coach and amazing person. We just actually met up a few months ago and I just knew that she was amazing and going to be part of my life. And so I'm so honored to have you here, Tamika, and I'd love you to share more about what you do as a coach. Uh, Amanda, thank you so much for having me. This is so exciting. Um, and as a mindset coach, I just help other women get to the root of what could be keeping them stuck or what's keeping them from becoming consistent in their routines, what's keeping them from forming positive habits, um, and really diving into the root of what it is that's you know keeping them from going forward. Um, and being consistent in their habits, uh, which as you know, Amanda, is really just a mindset shift um, daily. The internal work is daily um, and it is a choice to do so. And even though many people may choose to do so, it may, they may find it hard to do so on their own. So I walk along, alongside people to take them from where they are to where they desire to be. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing more about what you do or who you are that flows into what you do. And so we are here today, I, I, and I want to ask you to share part of your trauma story. Mm -hmm. yeah. So go on and share with us. Wow. Um, well, it's funny, as I said to you before, like trauma, I joked about, I joke about it all the time when I talk about, oh, tra trauma happens at conception. Um, mm -hmm. But it really does. Um, and I mean, and then the minute you're born, you know, you're cold and lonely and confused. So um, we could start there or we can start where the mind takes me, which is just in a place where I, um, I used to just experience things on my own, thinking that um, I'm doing so innocently. Um, is the way to explain it. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is just life in high school. Um, I remember specifically, I did not do so well in high school. I was a C average kid. I, um, my, my parents paid thousands and thousands of dollars for tutoring. I did not, uh, nothing could keep me, keep my interest in school. Um, and, to be honest, now that I think about that piece alone, because I was going somewhere, I'm like, that was pretty traumatic for me um, to feel so left behind in class, to feel like I'm really not understanding. I think now that I'm also, <clears throat> along with being a mindset coach, I work within the school district, a town over where I live, um, doing <clears throat> what's called cognitive behavioral interventions for trauma in schools. Mm -hmm. And um, now that I'm working in the school system, I see like so many students, so many of these young kids are medicated or there's so many avenues for them to, to cope in school. But going back to where I was, where, you know, I didn't know about attention deficit disorder or that wasn't that popular then. Um, I remember there was a time when my parents took me to get tested. Um, and I remember overhearing them talk about like, they don't know what's going on with me. You know, they don't know what, what could be the issue. And um, I never thought much about it then uh, in high school, it was coming up to graduation um, where you have to choose to go to college or whatnot. And I remember my dad saying to me, um, what skills are you good at? Like, 
do you think you may want to sew or cook or and <clears throat> I remember feeling dumb you know like I felt like wow I'm never gonna be good at anything that normal people are good at like I had friends who already knew they were going to be a doctor or friends that knew they were going to be lawyers um I remember one time uh, a friend of mine said you're so funny you should just drop out and do stand-up comedy and these were just little things that happened in my um in my ad adolescent life that I didn't recognize were like minute deposits of like trauma uh, so I, I remember um, because I kept such a hard shell, you know, I was very, I was protective without knowing that I was protecting myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was, I was funny. I was outgoing. I was social and I invested a lot of um, who I am in that person. And, and um, so, so just even thinking about that now, you know, just, it just, I just feel so like, wow, Tamika, like you've grown so much from a place where people really didn't think you're going to amount to anything. Um, I'm remembering when, when you have like yearbooks, um, and people sign your yearbook, there's this one girl, she's a doctor now, and she had written in my yearbook that, um, I guess I'll see you again when I'm driving past the gas station for you to pump my gas. And again, like I just laugh that stuff off. And I actually, this is probably a very vulnerable moment for me because I've never actually processed some of those stuff mm. uh, to the point where um, when I became a believer and I gave my life to the Lord, after trying to figure out life by myself for so long, you know, I went, to, I, I ended up going to college because I figured that was the next best thing to do. I didn't want to be stigmatized as the dumb girl who went to trade school and there's nothing against trade school. As a matter of fact, kind of wish I did, you know, learn some of those useful skills. Um, but I was like, I'm going to college and it was by the grace of God that I got into college because um, my grades were terrible and I went to the college my sister went to. She was a smart one. Everybody knew she loved to read. She was a little more introverted. And so I figured that was how you should be um, if you're gonna be smart. And, um, and so I applied, I went to Rutgers University and I spent seven years in school. Um, and again, I didn't take it seriously. I, I worked two jobs in retail. I, I, again, it was this overtly social I need people thing, which, which, which brought on addiction, addictions to people. I was in and out of relationships very quickly and I, I couldn't um, leave a relationship without securing another relationship. And so I, I just didn't wanna be alone. I didn't, I didn't know what it felt like to be alone. So I think that's also why nothing was ever processed. I, 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 would, just, I would just evoke myself in, so, in a social life in people, um, and so even when people would say something, I'm like, ha ha ha, let's go out. Let's, you know, just, you know, and, um, and, and so by the time I got to college and just being in relationship, I was kind of, I was people pleaser. Um, I would do whatever, you know, the person would want us to do in a relationship. And it got to a point where um, I became addicted to smoking weed, eventually became addicted to pornography. It was just all bad. I eventually felt like, well, if hell and heaven does exist, I'm going to hell. And I don't like that feeling. I'm like, I have no purpose. I'm good at nothing. So it's like all of the weight of like being nothing and nobody just, just, just really just ate at me at one time, mm -hmm. having never processed anything. And, um, and so I was like, I need to go to church because church seems like the place of hope. Um, and I, and I, if I'm in the building, I, I won't, I'll be spared from eternal damnation. And so I went and here's a pastor talking about, you know, how he was in school and, um, his addictions. And I was like, oh, that's me, you know, mm -hmm. um, long story short, I gave my life to the Lord and, um, actually I never turned back, but it was difficult because again, it, that's just salvation is one thing. I didn't know that God gave these earthly tools um, 
to give access to really reconditioning the mind um, and the heart um, to 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 move towards him. So, so it was rough. And I remember like in some of my addictions, particularly with mm-hmm. pornography and masturbation, I remember I used to like like right on my um my calendar if if I did it if I watched it to try my to try not to do it like I would try to practice my own coping without actually having to talk to someone because of all the shame associated with it mm-hmm. um and I remember even smoking I would do it in hiding or I couldn't socially smoke anymore I would do it by myself and I would I would try to do these these things um you know my my own way in, in what I th- thought was getting me the help that was necessary. And I remember after giving my life to Christ shortly after um, not having a foundation for what this means to be a Christian, I eventually went to seminary and in seminary, there's all these Bible scholars, there's all these like, it's overwhelming Bible stuff. Um, but I remember particularly a moment where I became so proud, um, so puffed up. I would tell people what they were doing was wrong. And, Mm -hmm. you know, like just really, and I, and again, that my protective piece transferred from me being this overtly funny and social person to me feeling like, oh, I'm better than everybody else because here I am now figuring out that I, I'm actually smart and I am going to school and I can do life. But again, like not dealing with the, the, the different traumas that I've, I've encountered on the way. And I remember having a moment mm-hmm. with the Lord um, guided by someone because I was like, I don't like this puffed up feeling. Mm-hmm. And she said, where do you think it's coming from? And I just got a clear picture of in high school when my parents took me to get tested and I was like no one my my not even my own parents did not think I was smart and so I got to a point instead of dealing with what was the root of the issue I kind of just capped it with with performing and now overachieving because now you know 15 years later, I have to prove to the girl who wrote that I'm going to be pumping her gas, that I could do something. I have to prove mm. to, to um, the girl who said that just do stand up comedy. And, and so now, you know, it just, I just started bawling and, 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 and crying was not an emotion I embrace because I've created for myself such a thick skin that I'm like, no one crying is for weak people. And I'm just gonna, you know, and Oh, actually, um, where that came from as well, sidebar, you know, in my home, I had a brother who was verbally abusive, um, mm-hmm. which is also a big piece to even a lot of, of the things that I entertained. Um, you know, I grew up in a blended household. Um, my dad had six of us. We had to, we grew up together closer now, but my brother um, really hated me. He hated me, he hated my mom and my sister who is also with my mom. And so he would speak such hurtful words. And so I kind of calloused myself in a way that I wouldn't allow words to hurt me. Mm -hmm. So doing that now in high school, when people said stuff, I'm like, ha ha, just like, you know, so now now I I made sure that words didn't hurt me. Um, And then now, now that I've been redeemed and saved, I didn't allow words to hurt me. But then on the flip side of that, you know, when you don't deal with what's on the inside you start bleeding out on people so it was coming up and here I am coming up on people like you're not doing things right you're I'm right you're wrong and it was just such a mess Amanda yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. but I but you know and I, I love and I thank you for sharing your story a lot of the story about what you're sharing is that when we're in pain, like when things happen when we're younger and there could have been initial events, right? Like emotional abuse or different words that we hear, we start to believe other people share over us. And big ones that I heard for you was I'm not good enough or I have to perform so that I'm smart. And we all have different core beliefs. And then came the performance and achievement. Then came the covering up to say, and and I, I love that you brought up that because I think that humor is interesting because people will, you, laughter is fun. 
a lot of times we use laughter to, to self-protect. So there's a self-protection in humor, and then there's an actual genuine humor, which is a whole a whole whole talk. <laughs> which, but I, I love that you shared that because when we and self-protection is something we all do, whatever it is, whether it be self-protection, perfection, self-protection, achievement, self-protection, and trying to do everything, be everything, and to unravel that is each person's unique journey. And then comes the like you said that addictions or the things that come that we try to numb the pain of feeling like that's the, our core belief essentially. And so I love that you share that even from like in high school where people don't realize even when we're younger, words matter yeah. and we can yeah. act like they don't, but they do. You remember them even now, like you were sharing about the gas station and things that we don't realize come up that we're healing internally so that we can be continue uh, free. And I love that you shared just your journey and how you came to know the Lord and then you continued in this journey. And so in this, in, you know, even in this journey till now, um, I always say there's practical tools, there can be spiritual tools, there's practical tools, there's all kinds of tools. And for you, even as a coach, you know, if people are on this journey, what are some, and really your journey, because they might be hearing something for theirs, but what were some things that you did that helped support you in shifting your mindset or even shifting you through that pain into um, less of that addiction or less of having to perform? Um, immediately journaling. Mm -hmm. I had to get my thoughts out. I had to get it out. I had to see it. I had to hear myself say it. Um, now I still journal, um, but I also, I also record myself. And at the end of the day, I'll, I'll record myself to recap my day. Um, and it's a practice that I picked up when I had a therapist once. And I, I wanted, as a, as a therapist as well, I wanted to make sure that I was being unbiased even with myself. And so mm -hmm. I didn't want to, pres like, I don't know, I was thinking too much, number one. And, and so I would say to my, my therapist, like, you know, like, how about I just, record my thoughts so you can hear you know because by the time I come to therapy I'm like oh I journal and it was good so all she hear is what I did but not so much the process mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um her feedback was so insightful and even when I heard myself um record myself um I was like okay that makes sense okay let me not keep this in let me not hide this even from me let me say it. Let me gross myself out by saying even the nastiest thought that comes to my mind mm -hmm. so that I can get it off of me and see where it's coming from. So it doesn't take me into a direction that I've been mm -hmm. free from, or it doesn't take me into a direction that will um, hinder, you know, my process and my mm -hmm. progress that I've made. Um, and then let me break through the shame by sharing this with someone who is safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are some of the things that I did because there's something that I learned from a professor. I'll never let it go. He said, secrets breed shame. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, it, even now, as I am sharing more about my story, um, and even with, with the part about my brother, <clears throat> ironically, my family, we're, we're, we're good now, you know, we have a, we meet every month. But I remember sharing with my family, like, hey, you know, as I grow in this space and become more vocal, um, there's parts of me that I'm going to share that involve you guys. Um, can we talk about this as a family? And everybody was like, no, mm. it's just not, you know, like you talk about your pieces. I'm like, but my pieces include you, you know, and I don't want you to have to hear it later on and, you know, have a reaction to it. Um, and so it helped me to kind of like, okay, let me write Tamika because you want to be able to say it in a way where you're not still processing the anger, you're still yeah. processing the hatred um, and, and then have, find some, someone who's safe. And, and to be honest, Amanda, we could talk about this one day, but I find so much safety in, in community and people who are, um, it, people who, 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 know that they know that they know that they also want to be healed and they yeah. also want to be free 
um, as opposed, so so I'm I've also learned to like be careful um, how I share, who I share with. Those things have has have been helpful um, for me. But but without a shadow of a doubt, journaling has been my best coping. Um, mm -hmm. I've never um, as a as a um, what do you call it? You know, coming from these different pieces of trauma that that are built into my story. Anxiety was never a thing for me, but I practice like deep breathing um, or square breathing every night um, mm -hmm. and just be, being mindful, um, not necessarily the mindfulness practice itself, but some of the tools. I think everything is stolen from the Lord. But anyway, <laughs> so it's just some of those those principles of just being mindful of my breaths my thoughts, mm -hmm. my behaviors, my attitudes, I mean, really help, uh, it really helped keep me in a place of peace uh, after moving from um, believing some of those, those lies. Yeah. So those are powerful. So I, I appreciate the, your, your explanation of some of these tools with the journaling and journaling again, sometimes you think, oh, I just said right, but you had like specific purposes where you were like, okay, I'm reflecting. And even as a tool to be like, where am I thinking? And even having someone who is like, okay, this is, can you see some of these roots? And also that you recorded that. So some of you who are not believing right now, which you are, we are all writers, but if you didn't get the memo, having a voice memo uh, would be good to just record yourself and hear how are you processing? And sometimes even those voice recorders can actually type for you. So there's many different tools today, but I love that Tamika. And I also love, again, this can look differently depending on your fi family dynamic. It really is. Um, for Tamika, you know, at first your family is like, eh, we're not gonna talk about some of this, but you were, you were sh explaining that. And sometimes that may be a healthy tool if the a family does want to do that. And sometimes everybody isn't, like you mentioned, shame or people are in, such a dysfunction where they don't recognize that it's dysfunction yeah. and so sometimes with that that's a great tool that you said i love that um but sometimes accepting that some families aren't there yet not that there's not hope so i love that tamika you did talk about that in your address and said hey this is something important to me i'm going to be sharing on it and again that's all we can do right all we can do is share that so i love that you did that but in the audience sometimes it can do that and sometimes it may take some time but there's always hope um and i also love that again like as you were reflecting you shared i know you talked about your faith you know that's a huge part of this you know you talked about the journaling and the recording and just really being able to get feedback um as you move, move forward and so i think even for people who are watching or listening there's some really simple tools that you used um to really help just get it out. And I think that's one of the biggest things and having trusted people Like you mentioned, you didn't share it with everybody. That's one of the final things that yes, there are some people. And sometimes even as we heal, we're called to tell many people and many people won't understand. And that's the, the inner healing that a lot that we have to be at or like as we go, because not everybody's going to understand why we're sharing what we're sharing, but it is part of the journey. And so some of you out there in the audience, if you're listening, definitely we want you to be commenting and asking questions to Tamika or myself. These are great conversations. And if you have questions, certainly we can answer. And then finally, Tamika, as we're coming to the end of this amazing talk, just hearing your story and your strategies and things that are, are on your heart, for the audience of people who may have been where you were when you were younger, maybe even at the root of what happened when young Tamika heard those words spoken over her, or people who are in the in the middle part where they're just like, whatever, just gonna keep going, where there's sort of numbness of the pain. Um, what, are, what are some words of encouragement that you might offer to, to people that are on the journey? I mean, always just keep moving forward. I know that sometimes, um, for me, one of the hardest things was when I was trying to um, do better. If I if I slipped up or if I missed a few days, I'd be like, oh, like this is not worth it. It's not. This is not easy. Um, and at this point, I'm like, okay, I missed a few days. Let's just get right back on it. You know, um, I 
There's a book I also wanted to recommend. It's called Soul Care. It's seven transformational principles for a healthy soul. Mm. And so I would recommend even like doing doing in like doing internal work in pieces. Um, again, my same professor, um, he was a mentor for me, and I remember he's he said, um, when check your tanks, your emotional tank, your physical tank, your spiritual tank. If they're low, um, figure out what's wrong. And so just encourage you to not stay in a low place um, because that really isn't okay, but give yourself permission to feel all the things. Um, just like, you know, I shared like not wanting to cry and hardening my own heart. Um, feel it, feel it and um, acknowledge it and um, move forward, not mm -hmm. necessarily move on. Mm -hmm. No, that's really good. Thank you so much, Tamika. So audience, if you're hearing this, to, to not give up, to keep moving forward, to keep keeping on, and to know that, um, you know, that there is hope. Like Tamika kept I, really moving ahead or like one step at a time and know that it does take time. I love how you said that when we think about our tanks, our physical, our love tank, our emotional, our spiritual, where is it? Because there are different tanks and they should all be congruent. But the reality is as humans, we're constantly making sure our tanks are there. Maybe they're not. Maybe there's things going on that need to be addressed. And I love that, that little assessment, checking in with yourself. And, and we know ourselves the most, like, where are we really tired or, you know, what's going on? So I love those little check-ins and the soul care sounds amazing. I'm all about the soul stuff. I uh, love that. And so certainly those of you who are listening, we um, hopefully you can take a lot away. I took a lot away just listening to your story, Tamika, and I honor you. And thank you, Tamika Smith, for sharing and talking about who you are and where you are now. So if you are just tuning in, hopefully you get to watch the whole show go back. This is Trauma Plicity Talk Show. It is held every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Amanda Hellman uh, author and speaker page on Facebook. And it will be coming, if you're listening, probably later. It'll be on podcasts and YouTube. And certainly you can listen to it again because there's so many nuggets. So thank you all. I love you. You matter. You're amazing. And continue to move ahead. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you, Tamika. Thank you.